Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and what are the internal contradictions of moral relativism? Well, it's difficult to, to um, I mean, the, the problem with moral relativism, I think, is that it's, it, it pretends to be a moral position or a meta-ethical position, but it's not really a coherent one. Uh, so I like to illustrate this with an example. So here's an example which is, um, has been an issue in, in Britain uh, quite recently. Um, should fox hunting on horses and with dogs be allowed? Um, so some people say yes, it's a part of the old British way of life. Farmers have always done this, landowners do it. Uh, other people say no, it's cruel. It's, uh, it's a nasty sport, it's bad, but it's obviously cruel to the fox. It's, it encourages um, unpleasant features in the, in the hunters. So that, that's the issue. Now I might hold what I might stand on one side of that issue. I, in fact, I do. I, I hold it's a, a shame and it probably ought to be a disallowed. Um, but other people, Roger Scruton, a friend of mine, stands on the other side of the issue, so he thinks it ought to be perfectly legal. And we each have arguments, and we can to and fro about it. Now, suppose a relativist comes in and says, ah, it's true for Simon that fox hunting should be banned, but it's true for Roger that fox hunting should be allowed. It's just they have their different truths. Truth is relative to the opinions of different people, something like that. Well, what does that mean? Um, If you think it's true for me that fox hunting should be allowed, and it's true for Roger that it's not, allowed. What position does that give you on fox hunting? Nothing. It it leaves it open. So do you, the relativist, have a view or not? Well, the relativist would say, well, my view is Simon's. Um, Okay, in that case, you think it's true that fox hunting should be banned. Not just true for Simon, but true. Um, That is, you'd campaign for fox hunting to be banned. You'd um, vote for politicians who say they'll ban it, ban it, and um, if you feel strongly enough about it, you're going to stand in front of fox hunts with banners saying stop it, and so on. On the other hand, if you agree with Roger, you go the other way. Um, but basically saying it's true for him that P and it's true for him that not P is not really making a useful move of any kind. It's not giving you a moral solution and it's not telling you how to think about it. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of way of dismissing the debate without contributing to it, and certainly without resolving it. So um, so I think it's just a, a sideshow. It's, a, in a sense, a... Um, uh, uh, it's, it's like somebody who get... You know, there's a room in which people are debating this thing, and the relativist stands outside the room with the earplugs in, um, saying, I, you know, I can't hear anything. And that's not a move in a debate. It's not even a move to say something interesting about a debate. It's just a withdrawal from a debate, which is sometimes a practical stance which has its virtues, but not, not, not when it's a question of what the law should be. Um, then you have to say yes or no. Mm-hmm. And aren't they contradicting themselves from the start when they say something along the lines of, uh, oh, there are no absolute moral truths, because I mean, that by uh, itself is an yeah. absolute moral truth, right? Yes, yes, well, that's, that's, a, that's right. There's a, um, a, a sort of self-refutation. It's an old um, problem in moral philosophy. Um, it's in the, the Theotetus, and the some, uh, Plato's, uh, and it's sometimes called the peritrope, where the relativist tries to say something which by his own lights can't be true, because it's within the scope of his relativism. And um, that's, uh, that's certainly a problem. It's, um, um, it's like somebody who says, all generalizations are false. 
well, that's itself a generalization. So does it stand in its own scope? <laughs> does it contradict itself? Um, I think relativists can kind of wriggle out of that argument, but it's certainly something they've got to think about. <laughs> yes. Uh, Yes, and would you classify nihilism under the rubric of moral relativism? Um, well, I think the moral relativist is, uh, aspires to be a nihilist, but, um, mm. but I think it's, nihilism is, I think, in a sense, different. Um, nihilism is a mood or an attitude um, probably best illustrated in some existentialist works, um, Camus, the outsider, um, becomes disenchanted with life and with the reasonings that people use to try and get moral values out of life. And it, it, it begins to think nothing matters. So nihilism is, I think, fundamentally the view that nothing matters. Um, and um, it attempts to give you a, a sort of disenchanted, perhaps cynical way of thinking that, you know, humanity is like a lot of ants, they scurry around, they fight, they die, it doesn't matter, it's like an anthill. You just don't, uh, you know, the wise person just stands back from it. It's a mood of uh, sort of disenchantment it's it's not it's a it's a cousin of a kind of religious disengagement too i mean buddhism um counsels a certain disengagement from the world of desire the world of ambition the world of plans mm -hmm. um so the buddhist monk sits silently in his monastery um staring at the wall and that's a kind of ni i think that's a kind of nihilism um, but it doesn't go along, or it's supposed not to go along, with cynicism and despair. It's supposed to be quite a, a calm and peaceful sort of rejection of um, human motivation, human life, human desire. Um, myself, I can't admire it. I think it's a, a feeble a way of living. Um, but I think nihilism appeals to people in certain, you know, usually rather miserable moods. And the only solution is to give them something to worry about, give them something to think about or care about, because human cares will come back soon enough. A nihilist who's hungry thinks that he is going to want food. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and would you say that uh, another contradiction that comes from moral relativists is that um, when they say that all moral values are equally valid, mm -hmm. I, I mean, th that's really not true even for them, because in order for someone to perform an action, they have to be motivated by, yes. by moral values, and, and so they have to choose between yeah. moral values to perform an action, otherwise they would just sit still, and even that would be a decision. That would be, that's a decision and an action, yes. I mean, the Buddhist is, um, he may think of himself as free from the world of desire, but if he sees some value in sitting silent and looking at a wall, then, well, seeing value in something is close to wanting it. So it's, um, it, it's, it's, it's not true. I mean, his action has a motivation, and the motivation is, in a sense, a kind of value or a kind of desire. It's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to step aside. Um, uh, it's a bit like people say, oh, with me, it's not a matter of reason, it's a matter of faith. <laughs> faith is supposed to be a good word. Um, um, well, it's a good word when it's your faith, but when it's somebody else's faith, then reason comes into it. And uh, when the faith starts telling you to do things, like 
um, kill the infidel or whatever it might do, then, uh, then of course you're entering the world of practice and ethics and you can't just withdraw and say, oh, you know, for me it's different. No. Uh, you've got to behave like a human being and if you don't, you suffer penalty. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, would, you, um, would you say that if we were to prove, scientifically speaking, uh, that there is absolutely no free will, that, that by itself would completely undermine the notion of personal responsibility? Um, well, if it would, I mean, it's, of course, free will is a very slippery concept, but if the idea is to undermine personal responsibility, I think that's um, uh, that's a very foolish thing to try to do. I think, um, I mean, the very simplest, we are responsible in the sense that we're part of the causal chains whereby things happen. Um, if I'm driving a car and being suicidal, I shut my eyes and then I crash into a bus full of people and kill a lot of people. I'm responsible for those deaths because I'm directly a major part of the causal story that led to their deaths. And that's, in that sense, the thermostat is responsible for the temperature in your room. The thermostat goes wrong, it's responsible for the room getting too hot or too cold. So um, a, a flaw or fault in a thermostat makes the thermostat responsible for what then happens. And a flaw or fault in a human being can make a human being responsible for what happens. So I think responsibility is going to stay. I don't think you can... I mean, Dostoevsky is quite good on this. He, um, he talks of um, uh, um, people doing terrible things and says, you know, that um, in Brothers Karamazov, um, Ivan tells the story of a landowner who uh, a little boy on his estate threw a stone which hit his favourite dog and the landowner retaliated by having his, his own dogs tear the little boy to pieces in front of his mother and um, Alyosha, the saintly person, tries to say Christ will forgive him and Ivan says, I don't want Christ to forgive him. <laughs> a world in which he's forgiven is worse than a world in which he's made to suffer some consequences for that terrible act. And I think that's, I'm on Ivan's side. I think that's, um, uh, that's part of the human world. We do hold each other responsible. I mean, there was a, a sort of liberal movement in maybe the middle of the last century you know, that it's somehow civilized to regard all crime as a kind of illness, as a kind of, um, uh, you know, something like getting a cold for which you're not responsible. Um, and that was supposed to be a sort of a, a, an improvement in our morality, our, our way of thinking about things. Uh, and then a, a philosopher called Sir Peter Strawson, a very distinguished Oxford philosopher, wrote a, a wonderful paper called Freedom and Responsibility. And he pointed out that um, being treated like a patient, um, as somebody to be managed or handled or um, somebody in the grip of a... Um, some strange um, addiction or obsession. That's taking away personal responsibility, but it's also taking away the basis of self-respect. Um, it is demeaning. It's treating the person like a child or an animal um, rather than as a responsible human being, a human being that answers to reason and ought to have a voice in their heads telling them not to do whatever it was they were doing. So um, so when someone like Bill Clinton comes along and he's been putting his, uh, his sex um, and says, oh, I'm a sex addict, he's, 
he's claiming a sort of immunity through the absence of responsibility, but he's also forfeiting any respect. It's a, it's a, it's, it's like I'm a child. I can't help it. Um, and you say, well, you bloody well should be able to help it at your age. <laughs> 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 Yes, yes, right. But okay, it's it's interesting that you brought up um, Ivan Karamazov from Dostoevsky's novel because um, isn't couldn't telling the truth to people sometimes be cruel? So, for, uh, an example: if someone is deeply religious and is dying in his bed and he wants to believe that he's going to die, but he will meet God or his family or something like that. Wouldn't, it, couldn't we consider to be cruel the fact that, for example, someone, an atheist, went there and said, oh, that's childish or that's foolish, God doesn't mm. exist and you're wrong? Yes, oh yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I, um, I'm as atheist, I think, as anybody can be. I have no use whatever for the concept of God. But when I find somebody who does, I don't automatically, you know, put up my fists and start fighting them. And I wouldn't dream of telling somebody on their deathbed that, you know, all their hopes. Well, I might tell a terrorist on his deathbed, but, he, <laughs> but, um, but somebody I loved and, uh, and cared for, they, they have the consolation of religion. They think that the Virgin Mary is going to look after them or something. Then... Um, uh, let them be. It's not doing any harm at that point. I mean, there's a sense in which I like to distinguish between um, people who are religious and people who are what I call religionists. Now, somebody can be religious just in the sense of having a rather uh, spiritual attitude to life. Um, they may go and look at the night sky, they feel sort of the strangeness of it, the magic of it, they start thinking thoughts about how did all this come about, how's it going to end, what's it all for, That may, those may be religious thoughts. I've got no worry about that at all. But when they're religionists, that means they take authority to be vested in the priest or the holy book, the tradition, the um, how they've been brought up to think, and they start telling people what to do. They have moral and political opinions which are supposed to derive authority from these sources, the Quran or the Bible or the Talmud or the Imam or the priest or the rabbi. And they're religionists. Uh, they're bringing their religion into practical affairs. And there, I think, one has to fight. I have to say, no, you have no magic source of authority. Um, if you choose to listen to the rabbi or the priest or the imam, that's your choice. But then we have to look at what he's telling you to do and try to work out for ourselves whether it's moral or whether it's immoral, often is, um, and, uh, and treat you accordingly. So... If some terrorist comes along and says, well, my imam tells me that the right thing to do is to kill it, infidels. I say, well, that may be true, and you're off to prison. You, you, you don't get a get-out-of-jail-free card because some moron with a beard tells you that the right thing to do was something or other. Sorry, I mean a long beard, not, not your kind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay, but okay. So now, now another question: um, How should we weigh pleasure when developing an ethical system? Because I mean, when people and people that part aren't particularly philosophers look at moral systems, they perhaps tend to associate them with being conscientious and, or, and always doing the right thing and avoiding bad behavior, uh, and that could put off 
<laughs> hedonists and people like that, but it also takes pl human pleasure into account, right? right? Yes, uh, uh, the, uh, I think any decent moral code or system, uh, I mean, I've, we've talked a little bit about whether system is the right word, but I think any decent morality would give a perfectly um, central place to the idea of pleasure. Pleasant lives are much nicer than unpleasant lives. And a lot of morality is, is, is about making life pleasant for each other. Um, just as, say, politeness is about making life pleasant for each other. Um, the, the norms of politeness that um, I don't tread me of toes, I don't speak too loud, I don't, uh, you know, shove my face in yours when we talk, um, so on. Um, I don't snatch food off your plate. Uh, all those norms um, are there in order to make social life pleasanter than it would otherwise be. And they have an authority because that matters. Uh, it can be very unpleasant to be uh, at the, uh, the receiving end of impolite behavior or just to be in the same railway carriage where two people are behaving impolitely it can be can be very unpleasant. So, so in that sense, pleasantness or pleasure, if we like, um, has a very important uh, um, part to play in thinking about how to live and thinking about morality. Of course, what the hedonist doesn't like is when the moralist says, well, yes, but sometimes you have to, you know, sacrifice your own pleasures. I mean, the you can't be on holiday all the time because your children need clothes and food. You can't, um, you know, spend all your time with wine, women, and song, if there's world's work to be done. Uh, and sometimes it's just self-interest. You know, if you don't um, get down to it, then you may be happy spending money today, but you won't have any tomorrow, and you'll be even more unhappy than you would otherwise have been. So self-interest and concern for your kin and your friends and your society determine a kind of... Um, balancing of immediate pleasure against a sort of common sense prudence and behaving prudently is often um, necessary unfortunately you know, if we lived in the garden of eden we just pluck food off trees and you know it would be, uh, be easy to be a hedonist um, but in the real world it's not <laughs> um, yes but on the other end perhaps it would be boring <laughs> Yes, it'd be very boring. Yeah, that's right. Yes, life is about competition and struggle and the cheap as much as it is about uh, eating grapes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And another question that I'm very much interested in is uh, the death of God, as people worried a lot about in the 19th century, particularly yeah. Nietzsche mm -hmm. and Dostoevsky and other people, because um, because th throughout most of human history, people lived under religious systems of one sort or the other. Uh, there are still a lot of people that think that yes. life would have no meaning without religion and without the existence of some no. sort of divinity or things like that. But uh, th doesn't science by itself by virtue of uh, teaching us that, for example, we have evolved emotions, feelings, mm. mor uh, moral sentiments, and so on, and that they are absolutely real, as everything else also gives meaning to life. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I believe that 100%. Um, it's always struck me as odd that people who um, uh, get extremely bored and fidgety and uh, so on after spending an hour in church on Sundays, think that somehow an eternity of singing hymns and looking at God is is, is going to give life meaning. It's going to make it absolutely intolerable. <laughs> sort of, uh, I think, um, you know, um, uh, but the, the idea that sort of it, it's all meaningless unless there's a God, I think is, 
is just extraordinarily foolish. As you rightly say, we have emotions, we have cares, we have um, uh, things that bother us. And those things, one by one, give meaning to moments in our lives. Um, and I think if you can find a meaning in each moment of your life, that's what it is for your life to have a meaning. Um, it doesn't have to be a sort of a goal beyond life to which life is a means. Um, that's not where you find meaning. I mean, the mother, uh, you know, the baby, the newly born baby smiles at the mother. That gives life meaning for the mother. Gives it an enormous amount of meaning. It's a, it's a fantastic sort of rush of um, endorphins and pleasure and emotion and and of course if conversely some uh, awful event happens that snatches the baby away that matters it matters more than anything else and um, those things mattering um, for good or bad um, that's what gives life meaning and of course the nihilist i think who finds no meaning in life um, somebody for whom nothing matters is, you know, basically depressed and maybe suicidal I mean, because that's the, his problem is he can't find something to, to care about. And having nothing to care about is next but thought of dying. Um, but you don't need God for that. Mm -hmm. I think it gets in the way. Mm -hmm. And couldn't immortality even more easily lead to lack of meaning? Because I mean, if we were to live forever, <laughs> I, I can I can very easily imagine that it would become very tedious with yeah. time. Oh. And and also apart from that, the fact that we wouldn't really take issue with the consequences of our actions. Well. <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, uh, uh, the, the famous opera about that is the Macropolis case by Janacek, um, uh, where Elena Macropolis has uh, lived for, I think it's three or four hundred years, and seen everything and done everything, and life is absolutely tedious. And that's only three hundred years, that's not forever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a very amusing um, sort of, uh, uh, there's a, a book by um, Julian Barnes, who's a novelist, um, The History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, which is quite a very funny philosophical novel. And um, in the last chapter, you've got somebody who's in heaven. And he's uh, the thing that's given his life most meaning down on, uh, on earth was golf. So now he's in heaven, but he's in, he in heaven, you see, nothing can go wrong. So every time he plays golf, he holes out in 18 strokes. It's a hole in one for each of the 18 holes. So, so there's never any, it suddenly becomes pointless. There's never any point in doing it unless there's a possibility of going wrong. But in heaven, there's no possibility of going wrong. So golf, golf loses all its attractions, uh, in which case it's not heaven because, you know, there's, there's been a loss. So there's a sort of contradiction in imagine everything going all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's hell then instead yes. of heaven, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so perhaps, and just to knock to not take much more of your time, Dr. Yep. Blackburn, uh, yep. one last question that is, um, what is for you the relationship between beauty and truth and morality? Because I, I will give you my take on it and then perhaps you can comment on it. That is, uh, I relate beauty to truth in the sense that, uh, again, from, an ev from a scientific evolutionary perspective, that uh, the bodily traits that we find as cues mm. to good mm. genes, health, fertility, and so on, uh, are good, so th that would be, uh, or, 
or perhaps that would correspond to some uh, to something that is true out there with, uh, because it corresponds to something that is based on reality that is the genes elf fertility and so on and it is related to what we deem to be beautiful in in the opposite sex or the same sex of course and uh, the relationship between beauty and morality i put it in the way that uh, when we have contact with for example uh, the deeds of great men we usually uh, are, get an incentive to move towards a goal to do something that could be considered to be good and yeah. and things like that yes I, I i i think that's right roberto it's a it's um uh, um it, it's a it's a very complicated problem because um well for example in the 18th century i think the first really naturalist philosophers people like hume thought the um, right thing to think about, um, say, landscapes, was that we found beautiful, uh, productive landscapes, landscapes that sort of fields of corn, um, productive forests, uh, you know, fertile landscapes, landscapes that are nicely farmed. These are, these are beautiful. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, so there was a direct connection between beauty and utility um, and of course as you say evolutionarily it's, it's easy to suppose that that's especially true of our appreciation of um, people you know the, the, the beautiful person is uh, athletic um, or perhaps in the case of women have very obvious signs of health um, good good childbearing prospects and so on um, the, um, the, the Humean view got a bit of a knock on the head culturally because about 30 years later after he wrote, he was writing in about 1750, in fact, even as he was writing, the, an aesthetic was starting up which um, valued the sublime rather than the peaceful or the productive or the fertile. So. Um, the hero became sort of not so much a, um, a, a good father figure, um, but the, the Byronic hero. Um, Byron was lame, but he and he was dangerous, mad, bad, and dangerous to know. But that became the attractive sort of figure, the romantic hero. And of course. Um, the most beautiful landscapes started to see not nice fertile lands, not nice fertile farmsteads and things, but mountains and uh, seas and storms and so on. So you've got an aesthetic of people going to the Alps instead of going and looking at Burgundy or somewhere that would have met Hume's approval. And um, it's harder to account for that in terms of utility. I mean, um, if you read 18th century writing, something like the Alps, they'd have called horrid. You know, these are that's a place you go through on the way to Italy, which is lovely. Um, whereas by the 19th century, the people troop into the Alps, um, and that's a shift in sensibility, the romantic for about a romantic revolution. Um, and it's very difficult to see it as having a function in terms of utility or. Uh, some other currency. I think what it shows is that people, um, you know, we're very flexible and we can suddenly find something attractive because it offers a challenge. It's something worth, worth, worth pitting ourselves again. So mountaineering becomes a, a natural activity. Um, and you get people, you know, dangling on vertical rock climbs and so on. Very, very dangerous. Not good for the not a, not a uh, prudent thing to do, but exciting and, uh, and therefore attractive to people. So I think the, the you know the the relationship between aesthetics and utility is going to be complicated. And of course, nowadays uh, the, the most highly valued works of art don't even aspire to being beautiful. They aspire to being edgy and difficult and challenging and so on. 
Um, usually not beautiful either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, so, <laughs> okay, so uh, just before we finish here, yeah. Dr. Blackburn, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work on the internet? And I don't know, perhaps you're working on uh, another book at the moment that you might want to share with people or? Well, I'm, I've got a sort of hope of producing a book on um, contemporary pragmatism one day, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's still in the, um, in the stage of getting fertilized. It's not, it's not been born yet. <laughs> um, but that's what I, I'm, I'm interested in, the pragmatist tradition. This is people like Richard Rorty and Bob Brandon, uh, Wilfred Sellers, Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein. Uh, and I'd like to try and pull my thoughts about those people together uh, into a book. Um, but I've just published a little book on truth. It's called Truth or On Truth, um, which is a follow-up to a 2005 book, which I wrote about uh, postmodernist views about truth, Nietzsche, especially. We haven't talked much about Nietzsche, but I think it's very interesting. Um, and uh, so the idea of truth in general has always perplexed me and interested me. That's, that's, that's the topic. If people want to look at my work, um, my own website is easily available. If you look to look, just Google my name, Simon Blackburn. And I think the first thing is Wikipedia, which um, is, is just skip over that. And I think the next or the second or third website you'll come to is my Cambridge University website. It's um, www two slash cam slash ac class oh slash phil philosophy cam ac uk in my name. And so it's pretty obvious. And then there's papers, um, books, one or two jokes, reviews, and people can see roughly what I've been about for the last uh, 50 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so I will leave all of that in the description box of this video. And yes. Dr. Blackburn, it was really a true pleasure to talk with you today. It was a really pleasant and stimulating conversation. and. Perhaps I hope to have you again in the future on the channel to talk perhaps about Nietzsche. I don't know since you well, refer to him. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Roberto. It's been a pleasure. And if I may say so, you, you have a very, very good understanding of, of, of the questions to ask and uh, of what I've been trying to say. Thank you. Okay, so it's been a pleasure and please don't end the call. I will just uh, finish the recording, but don't end the call. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have, be, have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke and Nan Blanchett. Thank you for all.